It is time for Zerg versus Zerg at the GSTL on Heart of the Swarm here in our preseason. Violet has been chosen by Azubu. Yeah, Violet is going to be the next player for Team Azubu. He has to deal with JKS, a strong player against Terran. We've seen this in both GSTL matches that he played in so far. Now he is up against a fellow Zerg player. And Violet, he didn't come out in the last match, but now it's his time to shine. And he's been practicing a lot of ZBZ. Yep. ZBZ and Heart of the Swarm are mostly dominated by Mutalus at this moment in time because of their new acceleration and the regeneration. They are basically impossible to kill. It feels like Blizzard buffed the Spore Crawler to help out the mirror matchup. It always comes down a little bit to the timings that you choose. If you are a player who really wants to rush for the Mutalus, there are a lot of, of course, a lot of roach timings that you can use to punish your opponent. And uh, well. Violet, she's definitely a very experienced player. Usually starting things off with either a 15 hatch or going into a, a bit of an earlier pool play. This is the guy that lost his first game. One of the main reasons was that those destructible rocks took down four of his Widow Mines. Yeah, that was I have an unfortunate circumstance that happened to him there. I mean, it was kind of unlucky. It was a little bit weird, but that's just what yeah. happened. The Widow Mines got crushed by those rocks. Dustin Browder, one. Super Dustin Nova, Browder, zero. Yeah. Dustin Browder is definitely like a humble one. Like this, he's... <laughs> have you seen this GIF? Oh, yeah. Have you seen this GIF where Dustin Browder is sitting in the audience and there's just a group of Marines shooting at destructible rocks and like the Marines just, the hit points of the rocks get lower and you see Dustin Browder go like, he starts clapping at first and you see the hit points get lower and then he goes back to Dustin Browder and he like starts clapping even more and the like, rocks that. blow up and he's like, goes like this. <laughs> no, I didn't see that. It's so perfect. I hope somebody links that to me on Twitter. I haven't yeah. seen it in a while. I haven't seen that ever. Yeah. Well, that, I can certainly, yeah. <laughs> I, I hope someone tweets that to me at Proxy Wolf so I can show Calder in our NS five minute break because it's definitely worth a viewing for sure. Well, we are currently waiting for the game to start and this is going to be pretty cool. Zerg versus Zerg, we had one so far. He's, but he's set up his Protoss right now. He's not going to play Protoss well. I'm pretty sure he's not, but I'm 100% sure that he's not playing. He's been playing Heart of the Swarm as Zerg and it would be really, really weird if we would suddenly without training switch to Protoss. That would be a little bit awkward. I'm just going to verify. <laughs> No, I actually think that he's probably just setting up his gear and uh, then he's going to be switched back to Zerg. Yeah, he's something about his drivers, though. so probably he's just not even really paying attention to the lobby right now. But Yeah. So, what Violet was saying the last time that we saw him, which is roughly a week ago, he was playing a lot of Heart of the Swarm. He was actually on rank 3 at some point and uh, doing really well, but then he hit a little bit of a dry spot and fell about 20 or 30 ranks in uh, the Grandmaster ladder. So, practicing quite a lot, has most problems against Terrence these days. Against the other races, he's doing quite well so far, and this is also why we see him now against JKS. Yeah. ZBZ remains, the early game is relatively unchanged, the mid game is yeah. muta dominant, then the late game we've seen players make interesting choices, uh, we've seen some blinding cloud because it's so good against the range units, we've seen some swarm host use, a lot of people are talking about whether they're good or not right now in the late game, but obviously you have to get out of the mutalist phase first, and sometimes you just don't get out of that, sometimes it just becomes muta versus muta the whole game long and somebody eventually dies. We've also seen that JKS is a really aggressive player, he relies to put up the aggression so we could see him with an early pool, that might end things before it even really starts so one of the things that we could see here in this match on the other hand we have seen uh, a lot of strange uh, not really strange but a lot of very intuitive decision making by JKS so I'm not quite sure what he's gonna do in the matchup against Zerg against Taran he had a variety of strategies that he was using now against Zerg I would give in general Violet the upper hand here but the thing is that JKS has proven to be really strong. Before we go into this, we have a quick look oh, at wow. the replay. And this is the Dustin Broder Memorial This moment. is tragedy. I want to see this in slow motion. Uh, we don't have control over the replay, but if I did... Look at this. He burrows the Widowmines to deal with the Lings. Now they're all activated here. And, and then boom. boom. And they're just going to disappear, basically. Uh, without a trace. It's and really he stops gone. the push, he delays it, and he kills the Widowmines. There was like... I would have loved to see a camera shot of JKS in exactly this moment. Yeah. I'm sure he was like, yes. He was probably like uh, Emperor Palpatine in Star Wars Episode 3 when he was watching the fight between Count Dooku and Anakin where he goes, yeah. Think about how happy he always is when he's coming out of the booth. He was probably just jumping up and down the entire time. I mean, this is like the winning moment of the game. The thing is, when he sees the rocks fall, I'm sure there's like a moment of uncertainty. He's like, well, did I kill the Little Mines or not? <laughs> now we can see, of course, with his overseer that he did. And it's, it's very clear. He does lose the evolution damage, but he just has way too many roaches. The production, the time that he had to set this up, 
You can see his worker count is at 56 to 47 here, so he's he's pretty drone heavy. Even with the, all these drones, he had enough larva, his injects were really good, he got the roaches out, and it was a great defense. Yeah, and here now, with those, yeah, with a few remaining siege tanks that he has, he can't really do a thing. I was really worried when Blizzard made the change that you don't have to research the siege tank ability anymore for the siege tanks, because that means you can hit so many timings now as a Terran player. I would like to see uh, the Terran really try to turtle quite a lot. In We haven't seen this in the GSTL just yet, but if you turtle on uh, two to three bases with Widow Mines, with the Siege Tanks, with the earlier Siege Mode right now, this is something that we will most likely see at some point. These days, Terran tries to be very, very aggressive and just put on the aggression early on in the game. Yeah, this is just a matchup that Terrans are doing oh so well in right now. You can see Supernova with... <laughs> Not happy to be in camera. The only face that you can see after watching a game like that, he's like, yeah, it's true. He's like, yeah, I noticed. He's like, yeah, definitely they did die. He's like, this is true, yeah. Uh, it was kind of, it was really terrible, and now I lost, yeah. I think that probably <laughs> never happened to him. Yeah, he's probably like, ugh. I mean, I read that as well, okay? If the rocks collapse and you have units there, they die. But it's happened to me twice, actually, where it Zelda never happened died. to me, and this is like one of these things where, where you look at the game, and even though you played like a hundred games, it might have never really happened to him in such a scenario. So now suddenly he borrows his Widowmind, sees the few Zerglings, and then the, the towers collapse, and he's like, whoa, wait a second, where if are you, we If you're a Zerg player or a Pros player who kills the rocks often, you use your melee units, your Zerglings and your Zealots, and oftentimes they surround the yeah. rocks. So you do get a little bit scared at times, you're like, wait a minute, and you like pull a few of them away, you're like, okay, this should be fine now, then they go down, and you're like, alright, everything's good. Um, As a Terran, you have ranged units, so... I love the uh, way the rocks work, by the way. Um, right now, I'm using them a lot. The way they're used normally is you kill them to secure your expansion, then no Ling Run Bias example can happen. What I do a lot of the time is I kill the rocks early, and then this happens, it's designed this way on some maps. If you kill the rocks early, then the rocks block your opponent's expansion. So rather than how it is normally in Wings of Liberty, where the rocks block the expansion, so you have to take your third a bit late, you can kill rocks to make more rocks at your opponent's base. It's really annoying. What Wolf just did was securing himself a spot at the next WCS tournament. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> Dustin is watching you. I know. <laughs> uh, no, I'll be there. Jokes aside, I, uh, yeah, I agree with what you said. I really like that quite a lot. The mechanics work quite well. I love that we now have those small rock thingies in front of the ramp and not the supply depot oh, anymore. Oh, the placement on some of those things. All right, I'm trying all right, to. But still. I'm trying to do my sentry expand. All right, and I'm trying to make the wall from the ramp to my nexus. And I'm like, oh, what are these plates doing here? I can't make my pile in the right place, so I have to attack it with my zealot, my sentry, it delays my expand. Some of the placement on some of those rocks makes me a we'll little bit... We have to talk about that again. Yeah, I, we, I just want to sit down with Mr. Browder, we have to have a chat. You know what I'm waiting for? What I really wait for? We have only a few weeks left until we have the Heart of the Swamp being released. Yes. And I feel that before that happens, there is going to be at least one more patch. Like the final patch where Blizzard is like, okay, this is the version that we release to all of you out there. Not only to the eSports fans, but also to the casuals who don't really engage in big tournaments. And I'm waiting for that patch. I'm so excited about it because I want to see what kind of issues they're going to address. With the last one, they worked at the Halbats a little bit, but you can of course already tell that this is not going to be the last patch that we are going to see. Even after the game is released, there have to be a lot yeah. of changes. There will be a lot more games to play. Alright, well now we're actually just going to... I don't know, we we're like doing some something really like masochistic here, I don't know. Like, <laughs> like, Supernova is looking at it, he's like, I know I guys, I got go, the hint. The producer tells me my head, he's like, now we're putting other units in there. I'm like, well that's really terrible, I'm <laughs> sad <laughs> to hear that. <laughs> you know, so in that case, uh, the units actually naturally moved aside. Yeah. Obviously a burrowed unit that can't move while burrowed is not going to be able to escape. Okay, now we're watching the walks being killed. You know, these are ice rocks. I wonder if they melt if you attack the Hellions for too long. I don't think you can melt them. Well, I guess they're not really ice. They're really yeah. technically rock with ice on them. But coming back to the point, do you do you think there's going to be a last patch before the game yeah. is being released? I feel like the last patch has a certain tone of finality to it. Even though, like you said, after the game is released, there will be yeah. balance patches. But it's like, this is what Blizzard decided they're going to ship. This is what they say. 
is as balanced as they think they can get it right at that moment. Exactly. They're going to ship that game out, and it's going to be the final version. Yeah. I'm going to be really excited to see that. There I want to see what exactly patch. are the issues that they are going to address. What's the new things that they will that they think in the matchup right in the matchups that we have right now is a bit of a problem. I think we may see for the first time a uh, damage change, for example, on a unit, something bigger. That's like, well, I think the Hellbite's damage should be two less, and then they might do something like that. But like. I don't think we're going to see like a new ability for a unit. I don't think they're going to oh, remove no, something no. from the Oracle or anything like that. It's just going to be numbers that they tweak or maybe cargo sizes. I think like it's going to be small tweaks. And at this point in time, you can't really roll out another major patch that you can't test and then be like, okay, guys, deal with it. And if we overlooked something and now one of those units is like horribly imbalanced, then, well, we're going to patch it afterwards. I feel it's going to be a few subtle tweaks, just thinking about a few of the things that you could do. And I mean, there are so many ideas out there. We talked about issues that that uh, um, rose up. So for example, if you if Blizzard decides to say, yes, we agree with what a lot of Protoss players said, that the medivacs with the speed upgrade are a little bit too fast, they're yeah. too strong. This idea with just replacing the ability or making sure that the ability costs a little bit of energy is out there, looks like a really good one. You could say, like, no, medivacs are completely fine as they are. You could reduce the speed a little bit. They can make it increase so that the cooldown. There are they so don't have the boost, but tweet. they can fly backwards. I don't know. I mean, it could be anything. That would look a little bit silly. <laughs> You can imagine like the drop comes in and he's like, I gotta get out of here and just drives backwards. <laughs> Um, uh, at this point, well, the problem is, you know, we talked about the medivac pilot, okay? And yeah. I'm not quite sure her abilities to drive. I like, I think, okay, sometimes it leaves the marine behind, but if now she has to drive backwards too, there's going to be a certain level of difficulty that comes with that. Maybe yeah. need a fusion core to research those uh, those abilities for the medivac pilots. Um, by the way, finally, it looks like. We have Violet's mouse drivers. The reason why we had this long downtime is because he had some issues with his mouse drivers. They're all set now. He is good to go. And he is, in fact, playing Zerg, so no question there. Yeah, switched his race. And we have Whirlwind, a very, very big map. And this is one of those maps. I mean, the thing about Violet is that he is really, really... He really likes to open with a 15 hatch or going into, like, an earlier pool. And I feel on a map like this, from Violet, we will see the 15 hatch. The thing is, I don't know what JKS is going to do. He has been proven to be a little bit cheeky, and he might do this in a ZVZ as well as in a Zergler as a turn. But we are going to find out in just a few seconds. We are jumping into game number two here at the GSTL 3 season match between Azubu and FXO. We have Violet up against the JKS. Get ready, ladies and gentlemen. The GSTL 3 season colorful. Starting to the top left of the map on Whirlwind, we currently see our Zubu Zerg player. Yes. A Zubu Violet. A Violet is Heart of the Swarm debut. He's up against the other Zerg on the other side of the map. The Zerg player in blue, known as. FXO JKS. Recently uh, partnered up with some Rock Towers to hold it push. Zubu fighting Make-A-Wish Foundation, I think is what that said. If it's not, the way Make-A-Wish Foundation is a good foundation. Just want to put that out there. <laughs> that a little bit overworked, but yeah. As long as I heard there was a problem there once where somebody wished for a million wishes and they didn't know what to do. They were trying to get a legal team in there, but the legal team was also wished away. But that became a problem. Actually, this is like the smartest thing ever. Think about it. People were always thinking, okay, if there is like a fairy and you get like three wishes, what do you wish for? And I was always so surprised that the first thing that people wished for was not a million wishes or like unlimited wishes. I was about to say, well, the other thing is, when people are like, oh, I wish for a million wishes, I'm like, listen, why wouldn't you, if you're going to go for that many wishes, you might as well say unlimited. What if one day you run out? What if you use all of your a million wishes? Yeah. Then you're screwed. What are you going to do then? With your last two wishes, like, oh, wow, I'm only down to two. I guess I could wish for another million. I'm like, listen, just wish for unlimited. 
That's that's the best choice. The thing is, are there wishing rules? Is the, it does it exist? Is the fairy suddenly tell you, lo wait, notice like you can't do that, and you're like, well, what can I wish for? And then suddenly she gets this sheet out with yeah, the rules. Yeah, well, that's what Robin Williams like, told me in Aladdin. Man, he pulled out this piece of paper and he was like, oh, well, you see, actually, it's, you can't wish for a million more wishes. You can't kill anybody. You can't make anybody fall in love. I'm like, all right, Robin Williams, why are you talking like that? <laughs> We have a uh, gas for both players pretty early at following the hatch first. Exactly, the hatch first play is pretty common here, especially Violet loves to go for a 15 hatch, even on smaller maps. And the same is also true for JKS. This is a big map, well, when you have to scout quite a lot, you don't know if you will find your opponent in the first position, you don't know exactly what he's doing. You can always gamble with the build orders, but this is the safer way to do it on such a big map. Gas has been taken by both players, and speed timings are very much the yeah, same. Yeah, they're 100% identical, in fact. The only variation on the production tab is that Violet gets an extra drone instead of the two wings that we see JKS making, so he's going to be, at the very slightest, a little bit safer with those two wings. He's going to be able to send them across the map to try to get some scouting information. He already knows a lot, though, with his Overlord they send out. And there's the Baneling Nest going down safely as well. With ramps as big as this, you uh, we usually have to get the Baneling Nest here. You can try to skip the Baneling Nest and go straight into Roaches. This is something that we don't see that often, but it happens. You have to rely on a lot more queens though. and You're usually trying to take care of your expansion by just double queening the ra um, ramp into the main base and pulling your drones if necessary. But going into the Baneling Nest is definitely uh, the choice that most uh, players prefer. It's a safer choice here. And uh, you are good set up in the early game, can even go for aggression if you see a greedy build by your opponent. So you can play a very reactionary style. What I noticed, um, interestingly, from both of these players, and I want to hear your opinion on this, both players made their Baneling Nests in plain sight at the natural. I wonder if that's because he's perhaps thinking that the Banelings of his opponent might get bugged out by that, might accidentally run into it, or maybe even it might buy him some time if the Ling's attack is base. Um, because it seems like otherwise you'd want to hide it. You don't necessarily want your opponent to know that you have a bailing nest, even if you're only going to use it defensively. You can wall with it a little bit, and you can already see that if you have those there, then if you can just run circles with your drones around buildings, and if you put several structures next to each other, yeah. then that helps you quite a lot. Exactly. It gets extra shots off with the spine crawler, with the queen, and uh, that's what you're kind of aiming for. You can for. see exactly like you said, the spine crawler here had a little bit more. Um, with the Baneling Nest next to it, there was less surface area for the Lings to attack. Unfortunately, though, he moved it away from the Baneling Nest now, so that becomes a bit uh, different than I originally intended that to be that statement. The Lair is identical timing for both these players. We have three gases going down for Violet a little bit faster than his opponent. Uh, yeah, he's taking the gas here, but I think... Uh, his opponent already had JKS two. has it already, exactly. He has a lead in gas at this point. Is now taking the remaining two gas. That will even out a little bit. Yeah. I really love these new animations in Heart of the Swarm. I think probably this is one of those things you can see there as well, kind of the effects that you can see with the blood. I think that I'll probably be saying this for the next two years. It'll be like 2015. I'll be like, I really love the Heart of the Swarm animations because I'll still love them. Uh, oh, Link wow, in the main Link base. gets in and he sees the lair. Will he see any tech? There's no tech to see. Not yet. The spires start at the natural. Yeah. Oh, actually in the wrong base. Yeah, now the other, the other players are yes. Both of them, uh, no surprise there, Muta versus Muta. And we talked about this. This is the thing that you kind of have to do. A lot of players are trying to experiment with new builds that you can execute. We talked a bit about Hydra pushes that are really difficult to pull off because if your opponent has a Baneling Nest on a map like this, he will, then, uh, yeah, Hydras are just in danger. If one of those Banelings gets in, most of the Hydras are dead or damaged and then the Muta list can clean up house. So this is one of the things that is very dangerous in this matchup. You are kind of forced to go into a, into a match with Mida Mida. Yes, and before the uh, third base is secure, there is a moment... Oh! Oh, what? You didn't get him! Oh my god, that Bailing has one hit point left, literally. And there were uh, probably about 12 Lings around it that he could have killed if he had uh, had it attack instantly. And then that one was poorly detonated. That was a shame what just happened there. We could have had so many more dead Zerglings. But those Zerglings want to live, they have families. Well, yeah, well they that, probably don't, but... This is the story of the kind Baneling, um, who gave his life exploding for no reason. But, as I was saying before those that Ling attack, the third base is so critical in Muta versus Muta because that extra two extractors you get at that base is going to allow you to have more Muta production than your opponent. But this third base is now really being pressured. There are so many Zerglings for Violet. JKS is really in trouble. He might lose this third base. Yeah, there's not, not enough Lings. Yet. And another Bailing uh, He does hit here. this one, but he tried not to. 
<laughs> he could really... There comes the Bailing trying to detonate. He could take down this third. If the third is gone, this, this means that there is a lot less gas for JKS than there yeah. is for Violet. And, and this he, is what it's all about in Mida vs. Mida. He goes for the Queen first. Oh. He needs to attack the Hatchery. There he goes. But eliminating the Queen first, I like that choice because he, that's something he knows he can get for sure. This is actually going to be really close. No, Hatchery at 250. You're actually right. Oh! Yeah. 45. JKS! Lost. Two hit points and he loses it. I cannot believe that he did not take them down. He actually turned away with the Mutalus. I was like, no, that's not going to be yeah. really close. He's going to survive with you this. You were actually right. I mean, it should not have been close. He should have been able to clear that up with those Mutas coming out. I can't well, believe this has happened. There's now a lot of weird mistakes going on in this game. Uh-oh, the Mutas from the side. Now he's got us around. This is a little bit weird. The Mutas are attacking the Zerglings instead of fighting the other Mutas. Now he brings them in. There are just too many. The Muta count at this point is a little bit better for Violet. And he has more gas than his opponent. Now with the Queen, he is going to take this Muta fight. JKS just lost the entire... Yeah, the entire momentum that he was building up earlier. So this is really horrible. You can see the Mutalist count with 6 to 11. And Carapace is about to finish for uh, Violet as well. Okay, the, the Mutalist versus Muto fight is officially over now. Yeah. JKS can try to fight, but he will lose any fight Mutalist versus Mutalist. The he only needs thing to get he can do us. is to exactly get the spores, which he's doing now, and I hope somehow there's a micro mistake of his opponent. Maybe he ends up with only eight of his 12 meters fighting in a fight or something like that, because otherwise Violet is just going to dominate the map. And that first fight, like you said, ends the battle. There's no more contest in Muta versus Muta anymore. And it almost guarantees him the win of this entire game. He needs to make sure he controls his Muta as well, but he's picking off Overlords, which is going to even further affect the production. Look at this. He is heavily, heavily supply blocked, and it's not even over yet. He has plus one armor against zero upgrades for JKS. Plus one attack has been started. Another queen goes down. He's trying to take down the spawn crawler. Then the Mutalist will go in again. And if this third phase is once again being cancelled, then this would probably already end the game. We have a run by to the top, trying to take down as many harvests as possible. Maybe even the expansion for Violet, but this is not really going to happen. Yeah, even, though, even though he did damage. Yeah, he can't. He can't go back in time, and that's what he wants to do. He wants to stop the gas that was mined earlier. Too bad there's nothing he can do about that. The gas is already mined. The Mutalist count is 23 to 16 right now. And if you guys haven't watched Muta versus Muta fights, first of all, go watch some Brood War. Second of all, they are pretty one-sided if the Mutalist count is even slightly in favor of the other person. And let's not only talk about the Mutalist count itself. The upgrades, plus one is done for Violet. Plus one attack is nearly done. He can go in and take down the third base of JKS anytime he wants to. Yeah, and this is just... This is what's going to happen repeatedly now. Violet is just going to continue to deny his opponent's third. The Spore Crawlers are going to help out, but one of them is already heavily damaged. Ooh, this is not a good situation for those Lings on the ground with those Banelings there. Right, oh, wow, go. a few of the Mews accidentally getting in there, and he loses almost three. He loses, lost two. He just has to take down the Banelings, and then the Zerklings can finish off things in the low ground where we have the Mutalist taking down the rest of the area. Yeah, the Lings go in to clear up the spores, just like in StarCraft 1, and then the rest of the Mews fight here. It's just so one-sided. This is the butterfly effect here, and JKS knows it. Yep. GG is out of the game. Violet takes a win for Team Azubu. Well done. The third base that JKS could not defend against the Zerglings because it's Mutalist. Yeah, his Mutalist just at some point said, you know, no, we're not going to kill those Zerglings. We just don't want to. And that lost him the third base, lost him the advantage. We had no more gas for him at the third while Violet was just mining too much, getting the upgrades out, and then taking the fights. Yeah, it was. I mean, once that first fight happened, you said it so well. You were like, there is no more contest here, Muta versus Muta. That fight is over. There will never be a time where he has enough years to fight against Violet's Muta. The only chance that he really had was turtling up, trying to go in through base, have those spore callers ready, trying to hold the third and wait for a mistake of his opponent. But this was really, this shifted the entire balance of the game so heavily in Violet's favor. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the thing is, Violet has enough lings on the ground to deal with those spores. So that means that JKS needs to make failings. Every Baneling he makes eventually adds up to, if you make four, for example, one less Muta you have when you're already behind in Muta. So your opponent, in this case Violet, does not need to make Banelings because he's the attacker with the links. Yeah. Violet with a victory. JKS only one win today, but still he was able to take down Supernova. So we will see who's going to be the next player for Team FXO.
I'm not quite sure who it's going to be. I would really love to see uh, um, Gumiho playing. Gumiho would be a good choice. Probably doesn't have as much out of the Swarm experience as other FXO players, so they might get a chance to prove themselves. Too. I would like to see Tier maybe come out. Talked about, yeah. Tier is like the one at this point who's. He doesn't have a specific role in this match necessarily, but maybe they didn't expect to play against a tough Zerg player this early, and they're like, all right, Tier, you can take care of it with the special build order, and then we'll just move into our normal plan. And this is a best of seven for the preseason, so there's a few less options available to them, though. Yeah, I think at the same time, FXO was always a team that tries to also prepare a few snipers. So if you look at the roster of Azubu, who do you prepare those snipers for? You know, of course, that Genius is most likely coming out. Supernova played the first game, so they had some preparation time. But Violet is a player that they didn't see. You can't prepare too yeah. much. But he is actually not lettering with the barcode. So he's playing with a normal Hangul account. This is why when you meet him in ladder, you know what he's doing. You can save replays. That's actually, uh, we'll talk about that in a second. And it is tier, in fact, that they choose. Nice. I like this choice a lot. It's To me, it's, it's the choice that just simply makes the most sense. Uh, but going back to what you were saying, that's a choice that Violet makes, which is really interesting, where if you reveal your identity on the ladder, you are just, you're basically saying, I am okay with everybody knowing about exactly what I'm practicing all the time, anytime anybody hits me. You know, I feel he probably also has a barcode account. I'm sure he but does. I was talking, I was actually thinking about this quite a lot. If you, if you are stuck a fan and you are playing, it would make sense for Blizzard to find a way to make sure that there can't be any barcode IDs. But on the other hand, if players are trying to prepare for matches, then uh, it just helps them a lot to practice those strategies. You never know exactly who you are up against. Yeah. So I'm not quite sure if I would, if I like the way that it is that we have so many barcodes. If I would prefer it the other way around, I, think about, I actually think about this all the time. Like when I'm showering or something, I'm like, yeah. ah, I don't know about these barcodes, but. I actually think the same thing at first, for me, especially when I'm watching a stream, for example, before people were using barcodes, it was awesome. When Huck was one of the first players out here streaming as a foreigner, he would hit an ST on the ladder, and you're like, wow, it's an ST on the ladder, cool. Yeah. Now you're never sure. You have players like Marine King uses uh, another player's ID, uses KT Flash, and eventually everyone finds out it's him. But for a long time, nobody knows who that really is. So that's another thing you can do as well without it's using a barcode. Also this guessing game, when you are like, hey, there's this guy on ladder, and this is ID, and he has such a sick win ratio right now. Does anyone know who that is? Yeah. And people are starting really to fun. analyze replays, and it's uh, pretty cool. So I miss those times a little bit. For pros, it's of course better if they can just experiment without revealing who they are. but. I'm not quite sure. I actually, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm a, little, a little bit torn in this issue. It's always important to have, I feel, if you're a pro gamer, at least multiple high MMR ladder accounts. Yeah. It's just valuable. It's useful. What we're going to see now is the Protoss versus Zerg. The two players are on screen. We have Tia versus Violet. We're jumping into the game in just a few seconds. Yeah, to kill on flats. This is the GSTL preseason tournament with Calder and Wolf, Azubu versus FXO.